Good morning, everyone. Um, those of you who are on the panel, as well as uh, the audience that we have on the live stream. It's very good to see all of you this morning. And we have indeed a fairly exciting event. So colleagues, we are after a year and a half since the public launch of the first report, been in a vibrant discussion all over the world around the sixth assessment report of the IPCC. The teams of scientists and policymakers and negotiators have been working for more than five years on organizing for us with these series of products, which have, I think, been more impactful than its five predecessors. The quality of the reports in all six of the assessment uh, reports have been excellent, but the sixth assessment report suite, which is a suite of six reports, three special reports, three working group reports, and now a synthesis report must go down as the one that has the why has had the widest range of discussions around its outcomes after each of the installments have come out. And I think it's not too difficult to go a little bit further to say that these reports have been extremely influential in very major discussions around climate issues, around development issues, around inequality issues, around emergency issues, around security issues all around the world in many, many significant fora. It has had influence in the United Nations system, not only the General Assembly uh, and all of the committees, but also in the UN Security Council. And we will recall that in 2021, an extremely significant resolution co-sponsored by Niger and the Republic of Ireland served in that Security Council, raised the level of conversation around the issue of climate emergency and climate security. And this is something that, although that resolution did not pass at that time, continues to be, be a very important point of discussion and mobilization inside that space. We also know this has been influential in the dealings of the world economy, the World Economic Forum, both in the Global Risk Register as well as in their frequent engagements have raised this to the highest bar. In fact, I would argue that this IPCC report and the work of the IPCC in general has been largely influential in engaging the perceptions of business leaders around the world in both the public sector and the private sector that has resulted in the top five of the 10 risks in the 10 year frame to the global economy, in fact, being firmly embedded in the climate change arena. So we are today privileged to be able to hear very directly on this latest installment, the synthesis report from three authors who have been pivotal to both the process internationally and also part of the leadership locally in South Africa around engaging these issues. We were going to have one of our commissioners, Minister uh, Marupini Ramagopa join us this morning, but there are many things happening in the country on a day-to-day -day basis, as you well know, and she's no longer be able, able to join us at the beginning. Perhaps she will join us a little bit later in the, in the program. So what we have in store today is first to have a set of presentations in fact, one after the other from three of the authors, and I'll introduce them just now. We will then have after that, a series of responses from the significant sectors in the South African system from our major social partners. And we were counting on Minister Ramagopa to talk to us from a government perspective, but the others that have been invited uh, will represent business, civil society, labor and the youth. And then we will have a panel interaction with those respondents, after which we will open this up to a Q&A for everybody who is attending this seminar. And I hope you will know all of the mechanics associated with how to get your questions in. So colleagues, um, with your permission and without further ado, 
let me introduce the presentations. So the IPCC team that is presenting for us today includes Deborah Roberts. Professor Roberts is someone we have been familiar with. She has led the discussions when we launched the Working Group 2 report. She's the co-chair of that working group and a long-standing member of this IPCC team, and in fact, the global climate science team that has been leading efforts. Uh, we're also joined by Chris Tresos. Uh, Chris has been an author on an individual report as well as the synthesis report, and uh, he is also featured in our previous dialogues. And we have Harold Winkler, and Harold has been a stalwart around climate science and the science policy bridge in the South African environment. And we are privileged in South Africa and on the African continent to have had in this AR6 round, the highest representation of African scientists in the development of these pivotal set of reports guiding the global conversation and hopefully many decisions around the world. So team, we're going to hand over to you and we're going to hand over to you in a sequence. So uh, we're going to run through all of the presentations one at a time, beginning with Chris Trisos, followed by Harold Winkler, and then Deborah will wrap up those presentations. So um, Chris, if you're ready to share, we're ready to hear. Good morning, Des, and thank you so much for having us. Are you able to hear me clearly? We can hear you perfectly fine. And see, see my see my screen. We can indeed. It looks great. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for for having us to share the results and discuss in more detail the the key messages of the IPCC six assessment report synthesis report. And as I'm going first. I'll say something briefly about the synthesis report as a whole. This brings together the IPCC work over the last uh, seven and a bit years. It synthesizes three working group reports on the physical climate science impact and adaptation, as well as mitigation, so reducing greenhouse gases or avoiding emissions. Um, and it also brings together three special reports, one on the ocean and the cryosphere, one on land, and one on global warming of 1.5 degrees. And so I'll be talking about key messages around near-term climate action, um, including risks, the benefits of early action, and the costs of delay. And so a first main message, which many of us are familiar with, is humans are responsible. Human activities are responsible for global warming, and this is principally through emissions of greenhouse gases from burning fossil fuels and from deforestation. And global surface temperature in the period 2011 to 2020 was 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And at that level of global warming, we've seen that climate change has caused heat waves, drought, and increased heavy precipitation in South Africa. And it's not just the land. We often think only about the land being affected by climate change. But uh, in the oceans around the African coast, the probability of a surface temperature heat wave in the surface layers of the ocean has also doubled um, compared to pre-industrial levels. And then importantly, vulnerable communities who have historically contributed among the least to the greenhouse gases causing climate change are on the front lines and disproportionately affected by the negative impacts. And so the IPCC is clear that the Climate change we've seen to date, climate change will continue in the near term, in the next decade or two, and that the adverse impacts from this climate change will continue to intensify. That said, there are many actions we can take now and in this decade to reduce greatly the future losses and damages, but we cannot eliminate them all. And so the actions we take in this decade will determine how much hotter and more dangerous the world will be experienced by us and our children. So if we look at this figure, it shows that a person born in 1950, along the bottom line there, has experienced 1.1 degrees Celsius of global warming by 2020. At 1.1 degrees Celsius of global warming, we've already seen widespread negative impacts, including mass die-offs of trees, massive bleaching of tropical coral reefs, reductions in the rate of agricultural productivity and staple crops in Africa, 
uh, damage to African economies and increases in heat-related illness and fatalities in all assessed regions by the IPCC. So this is just to list some of the impacts so far. And the IPCC best estimate of reaching 1.5 degrees Celsius is in the first half of the 2030s. And the choice we face is whether we will hold global warming close to 1.5 degrees Celsius, or whether we will blow right through 1.5 and keep going to even higher warming levels. So if we take rapid and sustained action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, a child born in 2020, if, if you look again at the bottom of that figure, would experience around 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming by the end of the century. That's what's labeled as the very low emission scenarios in this figure. But if we continue increasing our fossil fuel use, a child born in 2020 could experience up to four degrees Celsius of warming by the end of the century. And the negative impacts associated with that start to look a lot like a disaster movie uh, with adaptation options reaching their limits, uh, widespread crop failure, very high risk of extinction for many species across many regions. And so with increasing warming, an important result of the synthesis report that brings together aspects of working groups two and three is that the risks become more complex and more difficult to manage. So here's a, a case example from the synthesis report that talks about combinations of extreme heat and drought that reduce soil moisture and health and lead to reductions in food yield and quality in the center of this diagram. But at the same time, extreme heat can also reduce labor capacity for those people who work outdoors, which can reduce household income. And this can combine with already reduced household income from those that rely on agriculture for that income. This can lead to food price increases, it can reduce food security, increase malnutrition and decrease overall quality of life. And so we're getting a better and better understanding of how with increased warming, these compounding and cascading risks become more complex and difficult to manage. And this is another really important message about why it's important to do actions in a way that is not siloed, but rather thinks in a multi-sectoral way and seeks to <clears throat> gain as much from co-benefits and, and minimize trade-offs across sectors when we're taking climate action. So the IPCC assessment is very clear about the urgency of near-term action in the synthesis report. And this is a quote directly from the summary for policymakers of the synthesis report that says the choices and actions implemented in this decade will have impact now and for thousands of years. And that's because continued greenhouse gas emissions will affect all major climate system components with some of those impacts potentially irreversible on century or even millennial timescales such as ice sheet loss. And then mitigation, the urgency of mitigation act is that to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius with a more than 50% chance or to 2 degrees Celsius with a more than 67% chance, this involves rapid and deep greenhouse gas emissions reductions in all sectors this decade. Of course, it is equally important from a risk management perspective to close adaptation gaps. And because adaptation options often have long implementation times, Accelerated implementation of adaptation in this decade is important for closing those gaps, noting that the largest adaptation gaps are often among the lowest income groups. This near-term action in the next decade or two would yield multiple benefits. Foremost is substantially reduced losses and damages of holding climate change close to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to higher global warming levels. There are also really large co-benefits, particularly improved air quality and benefits for human health. Many sources of greenhouse gas emissions, such as burning coal and diesel, also emit other air pollutants harmful to human health. And so reducing greenhouse gas emissions improves air quality so that people can live longer and healthier lives. And estimates are that the benefits from improved air quality for human health, those economic benefits are the same order of magnitude as the costs of mitigation at a global scale. And the benefits could be even larger when just considering human health. There's also improved agricultural productivity and food security due to lower climate hazards and taking earlier adaptation 
that keeps many options in the food sector available. Biodiversity conservation, important here, we, we hear a lot about conservation and restoration as climate action, both are crucially important, but there are immediate benefits from conserving high carbon ecosystems such as tropical forests, some grasslands and peatland ecosystems, whereas restoration can take decades to show benefits in terms of reduced greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And then finally, taking action now that limits global warming to low levels results in more feasible and effective options being available to adapt to climate change risks. And this is because with increasing global warming, more adaptation options will reach their limits. For example, many ecosystem-based adaptation options rely on healthy ecosystems. And we know that above 1.5 degrees Celsius, many of these ecosystems such as coastal wetlands and tropical coral reefs begin to reach hard adaptation limits. Thinking about the timing of climate action in the next decades, looking to mitigation by sectors globally, the transition towards net zero carbon dioxide can have different pace across different sectors. And so if we look here, we see that in the land use change sector, net zero CO2 is reached earlier. And a big part of this is around halting deforestation and, ecosystem, and increasing ecosystem restoration. Very important also is that a decarbonized electricity sector helps other sectors such as transport industry and buildings to decarbonize. So what are the costs of delayed climate action if we don't take the action necessary this decade? Well, increased losses and damages, widespread severe risks across all regions, more human and natural systems reaching adaptation limits, as I mentioned already, many ecosystems begin to reach hard adaptation limits above 1.5 degrees Celsius. This is also true for small islands and other regions dependent on fresh water from snow melt or glaciers. Above two degrees Celsius, there is the assessment in the IPCC that many staple crops across large parts of Africa would have net yield declines even when implementing adaptation options. So I think the IPCC has clearly bust any myth of endless adaptation by making it very clear that by keeping global warming to lower levels, we leave ourselves more adaptation options, more feasible and more effective. There's the risk of locking in infrastructure as the climate changes rapidly in the future, having infrastructure that is designed for the climate of today. There's the risk of stranded assets, especially fossil fuel infrastructure that would have to be shut early in the context of more ambitious climate action. And there's reduced feasibility and effectiveness as well, not just adaptation options, but also mitigation options. So delayed mitigation that might then require, for example, large scale deployment of land based carbon capture and storage is less feasible at higher global warming levels as you have stronger trade offs with food security and water security. And a lot of that large scale deployment, such as bioenergy crops or afforestation itself is at risk from higher climate hazards with higher global warming levels such as drought and wildfire. The good news is there are multiple opportunities for scaling up climate action this decade and in the near term. I won't delve into this in detail because Harold will, will address it more other than to highlight that we need a wide portfolio of options and many of these are at relatively low cost, acknowledging that the feasibility and effectiveness and the availability of enabling conditions such as finance to deploy these options does differ across regions. But energy availability, sorry, energy reliability from an adaptation perspective, um, such as using smart grids for energy access and diversification can also have strong synergies with mitigation. So there's a lot of synergy between adaptation and mitigation and there are many mitigation options such as solar and wind that are relatively low cost. So to summarize, these rapid transitions across all sectors and systems are necessary to secure a livable and sustainable future for all by keeping global warming to low levels and providing <clears throat> adaptation to close adaptation gaps for the most vulnerable. The good news is many feasible, effective, and relatively low cost options are already available. And these include things like zero emissions technology, reducing and changing demand, high socioeconomic status individuals contribute disproportionately to greenhouse gas emissions, 
and have high potential to reduce emissions through changes in demand, um, increase social protection, such as universal access to healthcare, climate services, such as early warning systems, and conserving ecosystems. And then finally, how enabling conditions are essential, such as finance and governance for achieving these transitions. And I'll end just with a, a quick analogy. This is cover art from a synthesis report. But if we think of ourselves currently as, as racing down a carbon superhighway as a global society, we haven't yet really begun to hit the brakes. And the 1.5 exit is coming up really soon. Um, if we want to take that 1.5 exit, we've got to rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions this decade. The neighborhood we'll find there if we exit is more dangerous in terms of climate hazards than the one we live in right now. But over time, we could deploy a lot of adaptation options that are effective and we could even thrive there. The later we leave it to exit this highway, the more dangerous the neighborhood we'll find ourselves in. But if we miss 1.5, it doesn't mean we're committed to four. We should use all our efforts, best available technologies, international cooperation and cooperation at national and subnational scales to ensure that we can exit as soon as possible and deploy risk management options in a way that's as equitable as possible so that more and more people can live sustainable and healthy lives. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to the next presenter now. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and as we're waiting for Harold to load up, colleagues, uh, there are just over 150 of us now on this engagement, which is great. And some of you are already introducing yourselves on the chat, which is super. Please continue to do that. And please note that the Q&A is open. We've had a few uh, questions put up already. Please feel free to do so. Thank you. Um, Harold Winkler, over to you. Hi, uh, thank you, Desigan, and uh, thank you. Can you hear me and see the slides? We can hear you. Slides look great. Great, thank you very much. So I'm um, following on from Chris. So I worked on uh, the the Working Group 3 report and relevant here is also the special report on 1.5. Desigan, you mentioned uh, the, the reports that are being synthesized are six, three assessment reports and three special reports, but I'll dive into the mitigation part of this, building on what uh, Chris has already uh, mentioned. So um, Chris was already uh, introducing uh, uh, net zero CO2, and it's really important, um, I think, to understand uh, key differences between net zero CO2 and net zero of all greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And as the um, uh, diagram there makes clear that in global model mitigation pathways for any temperature level, what's shown here is 1.5 and 2 degrees, uh, net zero CO2 is reached earlier than uh, for all uh, greenhouse gases. Um, so they are definitely uh, not the same. CO2 is the only gas that we know how to remove from the atmosphere. We don't know how to do this for methane or any of the other, uh, other gases. And uh, so uh, when there are residual emissions of methane, uh, nitrous oxide and the, uh, and the trace gases, uh, we have to, uh, there has to be, we have to compensate by removing additional uh, CO2 uh, from the atmosphere to uh, get to uh, zero. So it's important to understand that that's different. And there's a complexity there that when, when we calculate it for all greenhouse gases, um, there are uh, CO2 equivalents, many of you will know, and the metrics uh, suffice it to say, it's very complicated. You're not supposed to be able to see, to read the um, uh, text at the bottom of the slide, but these will be circulated. There are uh, definitions uh, for those of you working with uh, net zero CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions. And my plea is whenever, you know, net zero as a phrase is actually uh, symbolically important, but analytically meaningless, unless you specify whether you're talking about CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions. Um, an important um, uh, message from the synthesis report is that by 2035, global emissions need to be around 60% below 2019 levels. Um, the number that you may have heard before, um, and, and if, you, if you look at the table there uh, from the Working Group 3 report was 43% uh, below 2019 by 2030. Um, and, and that's to have an even chance of staying below um, 1.5 degrees. You see these are picking out particular numbers. So it's important to note that 60% uh, is a median. That's in a wide range between 49 and 77%. Why 2035 and why has this been added from the 
IPCC AR6 database. Um, 2035 is the end year of the uh, second NECs, the nationally determined contributions. Um, and all countries uh, are, um, will start, we, we will start like everyone else preparing our second NDC next year. Um, and it's agreed that, the, that those will be implemented from 2031 to 2035. So it's important to know where globally we would need to be. We need to be around 60% below 2019 levels globally. What each country needs to do does depend on equity, uh, on fair shares. That's a whole complex matter. And so an important question for the policy debate is what South Africa will con contribute when we indeed prepare uh, that next uh, NDC. We have to communicate in 2025 to be precise. Actually, that's nine to 12 months before the COP. So that's actually by March 2025. Um, uh, Chris has already also mentioned uh, the, the, uh, that the key sources of emissions are fossil fuels and deforestation. So. An important message is that future CO2 emissions from existing uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, just the existing, exceed the remaining uh, global carbon budget um, uh, for 1.5 degrees. So if we project forward just running the existing coal-fired power plants and other, uh, other uses of coal, oil and gas, uh, all that infrastructure, uh, we exceed that carbon budget. Um, th th there's a complex figure here. I want to pick out some things. I first want to say I am focusing on the future in the bottom right, but before that, note that the historical emissions from 1850 and 2019 are important. So just says any global warming level uh, 1.5 or any other, you have to have both historical and future. But the lifetime emissions from fossil fuel infrastructure, given that we already have increased by 1.1 degree, as, as Chris said, due to the historical emissions, what remains is, is little and uh, the lifetime emissions from fossil fuel infrastructure, as you can see there, uh, go above the 1.5 degree line. And importantly, even for, um, and, and as it says on the left-hand side, the future emissions, and in this case, it's existing and plus planned fossil fuel infrastructure are projected to exceed two degrees with an 83% likelihood. So it's pretty certain that if we extend uh, uh, the life of fossil fuel infrastructure, be it coal, oil, or gas, uh, globally, uh, that we will um, actually uh, exceed the temperature goals that have been set on the Paris Agreement. Um, uh, some of the good news, and I'll go quickly over this, uh, Chris, has, Chris has already shown uh, some of this, but there are these options available for uh, system uh, transformations. Um, this is certainly across uh, different systems, and I think the framing in the IPCC, we sometimes talk about sectors, and those are important for implementation, but systems conveys also that all these sectors are connected with each other. Uh, they are feasible, effective, and low-cost options, um, both on the mitigation in the middle column but and on the adaptation side in the left-hand column. But what's also clear is we are not, globally, we are not taking these, up, these options up nearly quick enough which is why we're not reaching the 1.5 exit that Chris spoke about. The evidence suggests we, we're really just not using uh, that. And what we, we're seeing globally is that emissions are still rising um, uh, rather than uh, turning down. And what that means for South Africa hopefully will come up in the, in, in the discussion. Um, uh, finance is, is really important uh, for uh, transformative change. Um, I come more from the uh, working in free mitigation side, but there's currently no model for private sector finance of adaptation uh, for uh, highly vulnerable, which is mainly uh, the poor, poor communities are, are those that are uh, the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. There's a lot of debate internationally uh, about uh, private sector finance and insufficient public resources. And that's also a challenge for South Africa. So what, what is it, given that there's not, not, no such model, what uh, does this mean for local public sector finance uh, in, in, in South Africa? Finance for mitigation, um, we, there's still uh, very, there are increasing investments in um, renewable energy and low, other low emissions uh, technologies and systems. But Despite some disinvestment from uh, by financial institutions, the trend in, in fossil fuel infrastructure continue to rise, um, and that's just leading to um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, good strand assets estimated by IPCC for two degree uh, uh, pathway or two degree pathways in a range, a wide range, but a very large number, one to four trillion, one thousand to four thousand billion dollars for over those thirty five periods. 
this is in a situation where a uh, key techno energy technology are least cost wind and so the PV in particular, this is true in South Africa and globally, um, can be pri pri financed privately. Um, and so but, so, but what really remains important, so why on the one hand there is a trend of disinvestment that needs to external green finance is rising, um, but we need finance for the transition. And that is a critical enabler and of course, very relevant again in our, our discussions. Um, again, I won't read out all of this slide, but um, equity, as Chris has already emphasized, equity can enable ambition, but the first statement is that that's not currently where we're heading. The current trends, and this is a direct quote from the synthesis report, are incompatible with a sustainable, equitable world. Um, so some of the uh, future projections still see, for example, uh, higher shares of uh, fossil fuel uh, use in, in developed countries and in developing countries. These are important matters um, of equity. And the deep inequity remains that those least responsible for climate change, poor communities and, and countries, uh, poor communities everywhere and poor, poorer countries face, uh, the, are least able to adapt to the impacts of climate change. And then stated more positively, Prioritizing equity, climate justice, social justice, inclusion, and just transition processes can enable adaptation and ambitious mitigation actions and climate resilient development. The can is quite important here. Um, it's not necessarily so. Um, equity can sometimes be, in my opinion, misused to argue against climate action, but if, it's fra if we frame the approach in an inclusive and equitable manner, uh, certainly it can enable uh, ambition. And the other uh, matter to um, emphasize here, as Chris has already done this, all of this really requires an all of society, all of economy approach. This is no longer uh, and long has not been a, a narrow environmental issue. It's something that needs everybody uh, to participate. Um, there are some, so, so getting onto these, uh, uh, shifting our development pathways to become more low emissions and uh, climate resilient to greater sustainability is very important. I'm showing the left-hand side of a figure from the SPM, the summary for policymakers. I think Deborah may show the other part uh, in a moment, but there are um, constraints and enablers, both are there. So there are some uh, constraining ambitions that you can see in the bottom there. In fact, poverty, inequity, and injustice are, are constraints. The lack of finance is another one, but there are also this important list of enabling conditions, inclusive governance, with uh, which, which Deborah will, will talk to. Again, shifting finance in the right di direction and low, meaning low emissions and climate resilient. Um, and, and so that is uh, really important to understand, I think, and also what the global enabling conditions are and what, uh, of course, uh, the enabling environment in South Africa might be is, again, another matter that I think would be worth uh, taking into the discussion. Um, and then uh, I, I think this is my uh, final slide. It's very important uh, that there are integrated uh, policy packages um, that uh, shift uh, our, our, our development pathways. And what really matters, what's highlighted in, in red there, is that the choices that we make in this decade are, are really important. And these are not mere, these are choices about climate change, but they're very much choices about development, are about, in a sense, everything that we do. Uh, in the South African economy and, of course, globally as well. And with that, thank you very much, and I'll pass on to Deborah. Thank you very much, Harold. Uh, that was great. That was super. And you guys are doing brilliantly well on time. And so we're going to have plenty of time for discussion. Just want to encourage the folk to please use the Q&A a little bit more. Um, and now let's hand over to, to Deborah. All yours, man. Super. Thanks, Des. And good morning to everyone joining us on this particular call. Perhaps let me just um, begin with a shout out to both Harold and, and Chris. I think it is important to, to note that the authors of the IPCC are volunteers. So they volunteer on behalf of, of the public good. It's an extraordinary amount of work. And both Harold and Chris have been absolutely seminal in improving the quality and the policy relevance of the six assessment cycle as, as indicated by this. So just to, to thank them publicly for the extraordinary amount of work that they've invested in, in the cycle. I wanted to bring up the rear in the argument by looking at issues of governance and institutions, because I find 
as someone who works at that science policy interface, we can often go down the rabbit hole of greenhouse gas emissions and risks and impacts, and perhaps not focus as much as we should on the agency we have within existing governance and institutional systems. So I wanted to highlight some of the key messages that have emerged from the synthesis report in that particular arena. What the synthesis report does tell us is that the agreements we've got on the books at the international level, so think of the Kyoto Protocol, think of the Paris Agreement under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and think about related international agreements like the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, our assessment of the literature shows us that all of those have in fact supported rising levels of national ambition and development of climate policies, not only at the national level, but importantly at other levels such as subnational, which is where often the real work will need to be done. In addition, we've seen since AR5 increasing public awareness about the issue of, of climate change. And, and I agree with Des, I think the IPCC reports have had a lot to do with that. We've seen an increasing diversity of actors becoming involved in the climate change space. We've seen the emergence of mass societal movements. Think of Fridays for Future that have mobilized global youth around the world. And we've increasingly seen indigenous peoples and communities using a rights-based approach to begin to lobby for action in the climate change space. And these have already helped accelerate climate change ambition. So we can see that policy and governance are important aspects. As Harold has indicated, we have made progress with mitigation currently, uh, or certainly up until 2020, uh, we had 56 countries with laws regulating greenhouse gases. We've also seen the expansion of policies beyond national down to subnational level, which is an important area of action. But we do have uneven policy coverage, so the agricultural sector is one of those. But overall, our assessments points to the fact that these policies have led to avoided global emissions of several gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. As Harold indicated, what really works best is when you've got comprehensive, consistent policy packages. So instead of a scattering of distinct policies that are unrelated, really combining policies that embrace our mitigation ambition, but lock them into an understanding of the fact we need to shift our development pathways, we need to induce behavior change. Also importantly, economic instruments complemented by regulatory policies are seen to be effective. Important enablers for action in the mitigation space, obviously engagement with societal actors. People are becoming more and more interested in how climate change impacts on their life. And so involvement in this process is important. And international financial cooperation, the issue of finance is writ large in the synthesis report and remains both a potential opportunity, but currently a very large barrier. In terms of adaptation, we have seen progress in all sectors and all regions, and at least 170 countries, indeed many cities around the world, including many South African cities, have done a lot of pioneering work on adaptation. But unfortunately, we haven't been as successful as we have been in the mitigation space. Our progress is uneven. We're not adapting fast enough. Chris alluded to that large adaptation gap. And this is because our adaptation interventions tend to be small, they tend to be fragmented, and they tend to be very sectorally focused. So for example, our assessment called out that 60% of all documented adaptation to date is in response to water-related risks and impacts. Finance, a significant barrier currently for adaptation, only a small portion of the globally trapped finance goes into adaptation currently, as both Chris and, and Harold have alluded to, the bulk of this is from public sources. Uh, we've got very little engagement from the private sector in the adaptation space, and of course, limited financing always in the developing world. And so that very pragmatic message that, that Chris highlighted and, and Harold underscored, our current actions and policies are simply insufficient. At the speed we're going, we're going to blast past that 1.5 turnoff uh, that Chris alluded to. We've got a very large implementation gap between commitments and action. And if we continue doing what we're doing, we could well look at an increase in global temperature of well beyond three degrees by the end of the century. And just to note that figure of 1.1 1 .1 by 2020 is in fact updated in the longer report of the synthesis report. We're currently sitting at 1.15. So in short, we're ill-prepared for the hazards and the extraordinary threats we, in fact, are facing today. I live in the city of Durban. The flood events we experienced in 2022 is a real indication of the extraordinary threat that cities like ours 
uh, could face huge amounts of infrastructure damaged and we we're battling to, to replace it. So what should the institutional governance landscape look like to create this livable and sustainable world to get us off the highway at, at 1.5? Well, the synthesis report speaks very clearly to the fact that our governance systems and our institutional processes are really key to enabling us to harness those feasible, effective, low-cost options that both Chris and Harold have, have alluded to. They allow us to drive the system transitions that are absolutely vital to the transformative change that we need. So if we think about those key systems like industry, there we can see better coordinated action through value chains in terms of the urban environment, integrated and inclusive land use planning helps us create compact cities far more efficient. In terms of our natural systems, their governance systems can enable us to ensure cooperation and inclusive decision-making with indigenous peoples and local communities, particularly important when we're talking about the use of biodiversity for ecosystem-based adaptation, indigenous communities are vital. In terms of our health and nutritional system, the importance of public health policies, we're facing new threats, for example, invasive uh, mosquitoes from Asia, which are turning our ability to control malaria on the continent uh, really on its head. And from a societal point of view, we need the lifestyle changes that are required from each one of us to be supported by policies and infrastructure. As Chris and, and Harold have indicated, a big message is we've got to break down the silos. We can't be acting in one corner on adaptation and another corner on, on mitigation because there are synergies from pulling those two together and there's synergies from those actions together with sustainable development and the achievement of the sustainable development goals. So if we have a policy that reduces greenhouse gas emission, air pollution, we reduce global warming and improve air quality. So it's really important to bring the development back into the climate change space and sustainable development is a critical question we should be asking of all of our climate responses. Certainly we work towards greater sustainability through inclusive and more equitable approaches if we integrate adaptation, mitigation and development. If we see public sector, private sector and civil society and indigenous communities acting together, and we see an integration in decision-making, finance, and action across all levels of government and, and timescales. And so policies that shift us towards greater sustainability can in fact improve the portfolio of climate responses we have available to us. This is the other half of the figure that Harold referred to. What it does suggest is that every decision all of us make in our personal lives and in our professional lives counts because it's all of those choices that are gonna determine the extent to which we can achieve climate resilient development. And the notion behind climate resilient development is this integration of adaptation and mitigation with a view to enhancing sustainable development. But it's not only about integration, we need to use institutional governance responses to scale up our climate response. And we can do that by embedding climate responses in our development planning. So again, we're seeing this alliance between climate responses and development, helping us reduce vulnerability, protect our ecosystems and ensure this integration through climate resilient development. But scaling up responses is going to be context dependent. And so we're gonna to have to look at what enablers and barriers are appropriate in our particular context. And Harold asked many of those questions, but this kind of scaling up could also create very disruptive changes. And so again, governance and institutions are important for deep fiscal, financial institution and regulatory reforms that can help offset those adverse impacts and unlock mitigation potential. So the synthesis report identifies a number of prerequisites for effective climate change action. Top of the list, political commitment. We've been saying that since the special report of 1.5, you don't move the dial without political commitment. Important governance aspects, multi-level and inclusive governance. So not only national government, but other levels of government working together. Institutional frameworks, laws, policies, and strategies, all with clear goals. Coordination across multiple policy domains. Finance, it's a constantly a case of show me the money um, and informed by diverse knowledge. Science is important. That's why we've got the IPCC, but there's practical knowledge. There's indigenous knowledge. All of this needs to be brought to the table. Climate institutions are critical, particularly those across levels of government. And here I think about the, the PCC, you know, expert and coordinating bodies are key to effective climate governance because they enable co-produced multi-scale decision-making process. They help build consensus for action, for example, today's discussion, inform strategy development and settings. Those big enablers, not surprising that we find finance at the top of the list, 
as Harold and Chris indicated, we're short on all counts. If we look, for example, to mitigation, we need three to six times more than we're currently spending to go towards mitigation. But the good news is there is sufficient global capital to close this investment gap, but we've got to deal with these institutional regulatory and market barriers. International cooperation is essential and technology too. Enhanced technology innovation systems can help accelerate uh, widespread adoption. A really important message that emerges in the space, particularly from the Working Group 2 assessment, is the importance of equity and inclusion in everything that we do. If we want this massive transformative change, then we're going to have to centralize considerations of equity and justice, because that will allow us to talk about redistributive policies for these major changes, the creation of social safety nets. And so these become a critical part of our institutional and, and governance operation, equity, inclusion, participation, all key for this accelerated upscale of climate action, for building that societal trust, we're going to need to be able to take everyone with us, we can't afford to leave anyone behind, and to support the transformative changes. So in conclusion, the synthesis report lands us in a space where effective climate governance is about enabling both mitigation and adaptation with a view to sustainable development where it should provide overall direction based on our national circumstances, set targets and priorities that are clear that everyone can understand, mainstreams climate action across all policy domains. Climate change can't remain the preserve of the environmental departments of the world. Enhances monitoring and evaluation and regulatory certainty as the private sector is always calling for. Prioritizes decision-making that's inclusive, it's transparent, it's equitable and draws on diverse knowledges and partnerships for locally appropriate and socially acceptable solutions. So I'll end it there. And again, thanks for your attention and happy to work with Chris and Harold to answer any questions that might come. Nebula, thank you so very much. I think it was a big enough task to have a synthesis report that actually uh, summarizes in many ways with some value add analysis of more than five years of investigation, study, and analytics. And you three have managed to condense all of those into a really meaningful narrative in less than 40 minutes is absolutely remarkable. Thank you so much indeed. So colleagues, what we're going to do now is we're going to get some sectoral responses uh, to the entire suite of the sixth assessment report, but in particular, the synthesis report. And we're going to begin with Happy Kambule uh, with his business hat. Happy, over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, David, again, and uh, good morning to all the colleagues who are um, online as well as um, the, the presenters. I think um, the colleagues, uh, Professor Winkler, um, Theos, as well as uh, Dr. Roberts, the, the information that you've provided is, is quite illuminating. And, and one question that comes to mind, at least also looking at some of the outcomes or rather the, 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 the recommendations and the reflections from um, other, other authors and commentators on the IPCC um, report is, are, are we using the same uh, road analogy? Are we, are we on the road uh, moving so fast that we're also still going in the wrong direction or are we moving so slow that we are still in the right direction? And I think we, we need to be able to find out or figure out which direction we're really going. Because what we are hearing, at least from, or rather what I'm hearing from the from, from the presenters in this, um, in this session is that there's some good parts and there's some really worrisome developments and trends that are occurring. And when we look at it globally, the picture looks very dire, although the enablers as well as the critical um, areas of support are provided for, but they're just not good enough. And then on the second part I'm hearing is that at least in the in the ambit of mitigation, there has been avoided emissions that could have taken us much further in the wrong direction, um, in meaning that they would be increasing the, the impact, the net impact on the global temperature rise. And we are nowhere close to getting to the adaptive um, goal that we need. So I think from, from, from the private sector side, you've already indicated and seen that there, there is one critical area of concern that the private sector has always been um, worried about and still tries to get right. 
and the main area there is policy certainty. Now, in our case in South Africa, when we began to see indications and signals, at least at a policy level and a regulatory uh, level, uh, in the mitigation front, particularly in energy, we started to see that the private sector is starting to play a much bigger role in providing not only the end result or the end product, which is electricity, but also contributing to the necessary actions uh, of diversifying the electricity mix and the energy landscape. We're starting to see that the private sector is taking ESG considerations much more um, seriously. And we're starting to see that the private sector is taking the considerations of adaptation a little bit more deeper than what has previously been. But what we don't have, and I think this is something that uh, has been alluded to by the different um, presenters, is that if we don't have the necessary signals, if we don't have the regulatory environment that incentivizes action and also and, and, and also uh, places some form of punitive measure on the non-good actions, the kinds of actions that are necessary for us to have uh, behavioral change, we, 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 we are stuck in a vacuum of, of action. So, for example, what I would mean by that is obviously we know that adaptation is quite key. The more we adapt, we reduce our vulnerability and we do definitely do not want to see an instance of what happened in, in KZN where as soon as um, you, you're recovering from one particular disaster, another one comes in and then you also have a, another slow onset one um, occurring in the midst. So in order for the private sector, in order for the public sector to be able to get going on the necessary investments, on the necessary actions, we, re we definitely need uh, regulatory certainty. And second to that, I think what is key, and this is something and of a plea to, to colleagues is that as, as social partners, we should begin to, to start working together. I think the, the time where uh, social partners are at odds with each other about the direction of travel is gone. I think what we can be debating is the level of ambition or the level of action that needs to be done, but we should be working together to, to tighten and to coordinate our collective actions because there's a lot of action that is happening. It's just that it is unknown. And in most cases, it is uncoordinated and in some cases, uh, dupli duplicative and not necessarily uh, adding up to the necessary, um, uh, 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 necessary ambition. So I think, as my opening remarks, I think I want to just end off by saying that we need this policy certainty. We need to understand which direction of travel we're going. So we need to keep our hands on the wheel where we are actually implementing the NDCs. We cannot go back on our NDCs and the private sector is looking definitely at having a much more ambitious NDC moving into the next round of, of, of engagements because that is the thing that's going to move the dial. That is the thing that is gonna get South Africa to be more ambitious and to begin to, to implement a much more stringent approach on its own mitigation and um, adaptation, adaptation strategies. I would like to end there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Happy. Um, and and you've certainly pulled in a lot of the, the key and relevant issues that we're going to bring into the discussion just now. Um, I'm going to move straight over to Makoma Lakala Kala. Makoma, uh, representing civil society, ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you. And um, thank you very much, uh, particularly to the presenters, because you have just brought the report to life. And um, I got very scared with what um, uh, Deborah Roberts had said, that we are in pet. Yes, we are in pet. And we have seen what uh, people experience in different areas because of droughts, because of the flooding. And this is something that really we need to take into consideration that we really need to act fast on. Um, and this also echoes the climate action and climate justice calls over the past years. And this is the summary of this report to say, this is what they are presenting. This is what has been said by people for quite a long time, that there's a need for action, but how that action is taken, this is part of the challenge that we have. This report from what it has been presented provides a tool in which governments can use to review their climate commitments. We know that we have current air climate commitments, the continent has got climate commitments, but then how we review them and what sort of action would be taken or what sort of governance, legislative and regulatory processes would be put in the kind of climate crisis that we find ourselves in today. 
we know already that climate change is um, negatively affecting the attainment of human rights. And this was clear from the presentations that we have. And the, the, the negative implications are that the rights to life, to health, to food, to water, housing, education, cultural rights, and the decent work including the right to sustainable that we find ourselves in. If no action to mitigate climate change, it's, this would result in undermining our fundamental human rights. Um, the report also demonstrates that we can prevent irreversible harm to people and, and the planet. We do have solutions at our disposal, and those solutions are what we need to act on. That is replacing fossil fuels with renewables and uh, committing ourselves to a just transition. Um, Hippie has spoken at large around how social partners should come together and we can only achieve a just transition if all of us have got, um, we, we can be able to sit down and say, this is what we think would work for all of us. And we know that a livable future won't happen at all if you don't hit what has been presented by the team. But the biggest challenge that I see is how do we review our climate change ambitious uh, ambition plans on mitigation and adaptation. And um, this would include more on reviewing our nationally determined contributions. Are they in line with um, what the report has presented to us and what actually needs to be done? But then we can review them on paper. What is more important is, is the action. And the action will come uh, where we also would review our mitigation plans, if they are in line with that, our adaptation plans, whether they're in line with that, because this is the crisis that we're facing, that we can have everything good in paper. And this is what we've done over the years. But what is important is action, and this calls for action has been uh, acute, you know, in, 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 in villages, in townships, in, in corridors of, 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 of power, in government meetings, but we now need to, to act. But acting, um, there has been uh, proposals for, for solutions. And uh, what we need to ask ourselves is what needs to be urgently addressed and what kind of technology uh, I was saying would provide the solutions um, and maintaining our ecological balance that the people, uh, ecological balance that people are much more reliant on. So these are the questions. And uh, I think this report, um, it's, I'm not saying it's no, longer, it's no longer a warning. It says act now, because if you don't act now, you become complexity of um, the, the climate crisis and um, the, the destruction of our planet. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Makoma. Uh, very rich food for thought. And that little icon next to you uh, on we are running out of time is hugely significant. Uh, colleagues, moving on, uh, one of the sectors that's affected quite intimately by the whole notion of transition, which we all recognize that we have to do is of course labor because we have an embedded economic model inside the system. And, and Lebakang uh, Malawusi is going to offer a labor perspective on the report and its implication. Lebakang, over to you, ma'am. Thanks, Des, and, and thanks for the invitation to provide inputs on behalf of labor. I think the IPC synthesis report is clear. The time for action is now. Um, the climate crisis is not some existential crisis that we will meet 100 years from now. Um, the time for action is now. And as the synthesis report clearly mentions is that the window opportunity is slowly but surely becoming smaller and smaller. So indeed the time for, for action is now. I think an important part of the report should be around just an emphasis around a global fair deal. The 
ambitious action that is required for us to mitigate some of the impacts of the climate crisis. Sometimes, especially in the case of South Africa and emerging other emerging economies, it's sometimes in competition with the developmental needs of particular countries as well as their citizens. So in order for us to indeed scale up on our ambitious action, there really needs to be a global fair deal. I mean, the Paris Agreement, there is this notion of a similar but differentiated responsibility. Those that have benefited from, from mass um, globalized um, carbon emissions um, should be in a position to assist emerging economies and they should be doing much more. Um, it's, it's actually quite frustrating that those that have benefited and have industrialized their countries and have reaped the rewards of industrialization almost seek to punish smaller emerging economies, absolutely eroding um, this notion of a global fair deal. There are a number of issues that workers currently face, and I think workers are at the point where they do re realize that the climate crisis is here and the climate crisis is with us. I mean, you just have to look around you and see that there is definitely a change in our environment. Um, workers who work in the agricultural sector will tell you that their labor capacity and labor productivity has uh, declined over the years as it has become more hotter and hotter as the years have progressed. And this has impacted on labor productivity. And we see what this results in, especially in the agricultural sector. But if nothing is done, if if, if nothing is, is done to improve our position, it won't just be a case of agricultural sectors whose labor productivity has to decline as a result of high um, temperatures outside. This will be the case for all workers. And that has a potential negative impact on the economy. So there is a need for justice. And I am pleased that within this particular um, synthesis report, there is an appreciation that there needs to be equity and inclusion. And I think these are the important things that the labor movement particularly calls for. There's, there's this need around prioritizing equity, but this needs to be a global initiative. Um, it can't be at a domestic level, because like I said, there are um, common but differentiated responsibilities globally and again, greater responsibility needs to be placed in the hands of those that have benefited from mass um, globalization and industrialization. Um, so just to appreciate that the, 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 the report definitely identifies that there is a need for climate justice, social justice, inclusion, as well as just transition um, processes. In fact, if we enhance our ambition in terms of how well we do social justice inclusion and the just transition. This does have a replicate effect in how we're able to further boost our ambition. The two have to work hand in hand. It can't be a case of you boost your ambition without boosting your level of justice and social inclusion as you improve your levels of of, of ambition. There clearly is a case for our ability to build adap our adaptive capacity. So adaptation is going to be very important. The KwaZulu Natal experience has taught us that if we don't build some level of resilience in our infrastructure, the very little infrastructure that we're able to build will be washed away by extreme weather patterns. So there definitely is a need for us to boost um, adaptation as well as building uh, resilience. I think one thing that we should be lamenting in 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 this in this in this case or, or in this particular report is definitely the slow pace of implementation. I mean, nobody disputes the IPCC reports. I think everybody looks to them as a scientific base for what is to come, and nobody disputes what comes out as the scientific outcomes and outputs of the various reports. Mm -hmm. But it still seems as though there is still slow progress. And again, I put a large amount of responsibility of your more industrialized economies. And I think the push should be towards how much they can assist, especially in adherence to the various Paris agreements and the various COP negotiation agreements around implementation and just around the, the, the concepts of how the big polluters um, need to pay. Clearly, the time for action is now. The time for social justice 
is now because action has to go hand in hand with social justice. If we do one without the other, we create another existential crisis that puts our people in further devastation. And, and, and that would be just as catastrophic as one crisis that we're trying to, to, to contain currently. So again, the need for there to be ambitious, um, ambitious action, but that must also be coupled with the need for equity and inclusion, also prioritizing the needs of workers and communities. Thanks, Des. Thank you, Lebakong. That was brilliant uh, and, and very, very important issues. And the whole notion of a global fair deal is something that we have to work a lot harder at. Colleagues, one of the issues uh, that we talk about, but I think go lightly over, is the whole issue of intergenerational justice. And we acknowledge it, but don't do much about it, that we are organizing for the next generation and the generation after that to carry the can for the inaction today. But let's let's get someone to talk very directly to this issue. And we have uh, a youth representative in the form of Shlengiwe Khadebe. Uh, Shlengiwe, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Tess, again, and good, good morning to, uh, to everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to, to respond as well. Um, so the, inter uh, the IPCC warns of a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all, emphasizing that the choices and actions implemented in this decade will have far-reaching consequ consequences. For, for young people who are thinking about their future, knowing that there is an exp expiration date, older generations might share some of the fear but that is, that is often a sense of concern for their children and, grand, and grandchildren who will actually have to live with the consequences. Uh, young people often find themselves asking, how can I plan for the future? Um, when, um, the, when the report is telling us that the future is so, so dire, do the choices I make today even matter? And, and is there even a place for me to give meaning to the things that I do? A global study of 10,000 youth from 10 countries in 2021 found that 50% of young people felt sad, anxious, angry, powerless, helpless, and guilty about climate change. While 45% said their feelings. And um, I must also just say um, that every time the IPCC report uh, shares a, a, a report, I, I get very anxious, mostly because I think it's just for about four weeks or so, so everyone is writing about the report and it's just reminding us how, how dire the situation is. So it really is something that you are concerned about. Um, I asked on, um, some of the young people as well to give a response to how they are, um, they are feeling about climate change and what the IPCC report is saying. And Bradley Chauke said, climate change is an existential threat. Although the latest IPCC report has dying news, there's still lots of opportunities for the world to act. Um, someone else also said, our thoughts, views, and suggestions and innovations uh, uh, doesn't matter as young people in this country. It doesn't serve any purpose. Talk is cheap. What we need now is action that is just that is just done for formality. So you can see that um, some, uh, some young people are hopeful even in this, in, in this and some young people are feeling very hopeless because of how things are also in, and how we are responding um, as, as a country um, to climate change. Young people are worried about their future, not about their future, not just because climate change is to our many problems, we also worry about the state of the country, co corruption, jobs, poverty, and crime, and climate change is adding to all of this. The report confirms our uh, die of old age, whereas today's youth are more likely to die as a result of climate disasters if, the, if, if there's nothing that is done to address uh, the impacts of climate change. And also those who face the uh, harshest consequences of climate change, uh, particularly uh, uh, young people, um, 
uh, uh, women and uh, indigenous groups uh, are not making governing decisions. Commonly, peop uh, commonly people in positions of power are motivated to protect the status quo, which has given them the lifestyles they are accustomed to. So there's also that fight that um, those who are benefiting from uh, are also just trying to protect the status quo and we worry about that. But we can't allow fear and anxiety to lead to inaction. There's no time to waste. Young people are willing to be part of the solution more than ever. Young people are doing the work to reduce climate action. Efficient and effective youth involvement is important to identify the challenges, bring innovative uh, perspective, as well as train, prepare, and inform future generations about the mitigation and adaptation which will be necessary for decades to come. Young people want to do more and are doing more. Young people continue to take on leading roles in influencing, advocating, and demanding for responsible climate behavior and stronger political, political will from governments and the private sector. We want to influence policy um, so that to, to ensure that the, uh, the policies are more uh, um, ambitious and, and uh, protect our future. We want to be part of the in addition, who else, who else than the youth to do the monitoring and evaluation so that we can hold those in power accountable? Awareness raising, I think, was something that is very important about the IPCC report, and I commend all the uh, scientists that contribute to the IPCC report. They do a very good job of writing the report, but it's, it's a very uh, technical scientific uh, uh, report that is uh, hard to uh, to understand for, uh, for a lot of young people who, who, aren't, uh, who, who don't understand the, lang uh, the, the language and the jargon that is used. And young uh, and there's a role for young people for, for young people to actually help the IP, the IPCC to 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 ensure that that the IPCC report is much more access, accessible and and so that everyone understands what these consequences are because at the, at the moment some people do realize there are changes around them but they're not linking that to climate change so we definitely need the, the jargon and uh, of climate change to be much more simpler um uh, to everyone and young people can play a crucial role as well in, in doing that um a call to action is that the uh, the IPCC questions that the effectiveness of adaptation measures will decline as global warming um, increases. To address this challenge, we need to prioritize closing adaptation gaps and avoiding maladaptation. We need increased efforts towards increased engagement from private sector and citizens, increased climate uh, literacy, strong political commitment and increased sense of agency, as well as increased mobilization of finance. The IPCC report highlights the significant disparity between fossil fuel investment and damages. A drastic shift towards large investment in climate solutions is crucial to reverse this trend. Investing in green economy is the only path to a healthy, prosperous, and equitable future. Stakeholders must, uh, stakeholders must co collectively push away from the fuel, fossil fuel economy and old technologies and redirect attention to creating an economy that restores the, uh, the health of our planet, protects our species, and provides opportunities for all. With the huge success at COP27, crucial to keep up the effort and deliver applicable solutions with equity and justice considerations until COP28. Right now, the countries must pave the way for common ground on loss and damage finance and oper operationalize the new funds so that it delivers for those most affected. This rapid mobilization of finance is possible as COVID-19 pandemic has shown that we can actually gather finance if there's a will, um, from, if there's the will from everyone. In conclusion, the IPCC report is definitely a wake-up work, work call for all of us. It's good to see that the evidence for the action is clear, but now the challenge is figuring out the how. How do we make sustainable choices more accessible and affordable for everyone, especially those who are struggling uh, day to day? And how do we create systems that are equitable and, pass and participatory? Uh, and lastly, I just want to read um, again from uh, another young person and that I reached out to, and this was a call to action around uh, 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 how we can respond. As a vulnerable, uh, pop uh, vulnerable, as a vulnerable population group, we have limited access to resources, negatively imp impacting their ability to scale up climate action. 
it also leads to high competition for those limited uh, to, uh, for those limited resources defeating the point. There's a need for collective and, fam and family coordinated climate action. This competition is a distraction. The picture is significantly bigger. The, pre the Presidential Climate Commission is, is uniquely positioned to empower youth voices and ensure that the needs and concerns of young people are addressed. One way to do this one way to do this is by having more youth commissioners and a dedicated youth engagement team as part of the project management team of South Africa's Just Energy Transition Partnership implementation. The youth engagement team should go beyond mere consultation and take real action to prioritize youth in the, in the Just Energy Transition Partnership. One youth commissioner cannot be expected to represent an adv advocate for future generations successfully. Having a team of youth commissioners and a dedicated youth engagement team will ensure that youth voices are heard and that they will play an active role in shaping climate policy decisions. Empowering youth in this way will not only ensure that climate uh, policies consider the needs of the future generations, but will also create opportunities for youth to gain valuable skills and experiences in climate policy development and implementation. We urge the PCC to consider these recommendations and take action to engage in youth in South Africa's transition to a just and sustainable future. And that was from uh, Mujehim, uh, from Mujehim Mafatiri. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you so much, Lengue, uh, giving you a chance to die of old age. That is really, really sobering um, and, and, and quite poignant. And and recognizing, and I think it's something that we don't do often enough, that the climate anxiety issue is a clear phenomenon in the world and the bulk of that climate anxiety is in fact being carried by young people. Very sobering indeed. Colleagues, we, we now have a reasonable amount of time to get into a discussion. And we're first gonna ask uh, our three panelists to react to what they have heard from the different sectoral representatives. We are going to try and incorporate as much as we can the uh, questions and comments in the q and I, I can't guarantee that we're going to get all of them. Uh, so let me quickly read out the names of the people who have put things in the q and As to acknowledge you. There was Melu Shongwe, Alan Hall, Sunny Liuke, Bobby Jacobs, Mzwandile Mene, Nicholas King, Sean McDonald, welcome Sean, Brandon Abdener, uh, Lavdonia Mkanzi, Gordon Lang, uh, Bobby Jacobs again, uh, Boitemelo Cello, Richard Worthington, and Lauren de Kock. And we will try to get through as much as possible. But first, let me hand over to our IPCC panel, and maybe Deborah, uh, you can begin the responses. Thanks, Des, and, and thanks for the very rich verbal inputs and indeed the, the rich assortment of questions that, that Harold, Chris, and I have been trying to uh, deal with in, in the Q&A. So thank you for, for the interest. I, I think an important uh, point that I want to draw out is um, to, to better understand the role of of the IPCC. I think people are correctly asking, well, you know, all the science is available. And you must bear in mind, we've known about the greenhouse gas effects since 1822. So, you know, we, we've had access to science, which allows us to understand the problem, the extent of the problem and the solutions for almost two centuries now. The, the question is, how, why are we still in the situation where we've got, you know, Shlingui, we're talking about the youth wondering, you know, what, what the end of days will be like, a, a climate extreme event or, or a comfortable retirement somewhere um, in a not too, too warm sun. And, and I think we've got to see that the IPCC brings scientific assessment into the world. It doesn't engage in implementation. It doesn't engage in funding. It merely provides the evidence for, for action. So where does the, the buck stop? Well, the buck stops, and we highlighted it in our special report 1.5, with political and societal will. And I think many people have alluded to this. We've got an abundance of science. We've got science that talks to us about risks. We've got science that talks to us about solutions. Hopefully the seventh assessment cycle will give us great insights into to the realm of implementation. But unless that's accompanied by political will, 
we're not going to see the changes we need. We're not going to get off the highway at, at the 1.5 stop. So I think that's an important thing is we've got to look to the fact that the science is not going to get us all the way there, that, that politics and societal war are critical. The question is, how do you mobilize society to ensure the political world does drive in the right kind of uh, direction, given the, the vested interests, as many have, have indicated, a lot of people are benefiting from, from the status quo. So I think that's a question outside of the IPCC. The question is, how do we mobilize that society? How do we get the science out? And again, Nojling Biwe, when you were talking about how difficult these reports are, I can tell you they're not only difficult for youth. I work in local government. I, I can tell you that my local government uh, colleagues and, and councillors cannot use the IPCC reports in the form in which we produce them because we've got to trade, stay true to the science, they are complex by nature. And so I think a lot of work could be done in taking that science and putting it into partner organizations who can simplify and make relevant the messaging. And we've done some work uh, on that in the urban environment. So we took the three main assessment reports and various local government networks and NGOs worked uh, together with the oversight of the coaches, the IPCC on producing a summary for urban policymakers which is much more accessible uh, for, for us to use and um, to integrate into our thinking around the decision-making at, at the local level. But I think we need to do a lot more of that to mobilize society. I think there is going to be an important opportunity in the seventh assessment cycle with a special report on cities. So it'll be the first time that the IPCC begins to use its assessment to interrogate um, impacts and risks and solutions at, at the local level. And I think that also may help make the science uh, way more useful. But for me, the big conundrum is if we've had the science available for two centuries, why are we still speeding past the, the turn off to 1.5? And that's a bigger societal and, and political question. Thanks, Jessica. Very much, Deborah. Um, uh, who'd like to go next, Harold? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Desigan, and, and thank you to everyone for the uh, very good questions and comments uh, prior to respond there. I, I think I just want to highlight um, to make two further comments at, at this point. The one uh, follows on directly from what, what Deborah has just said, and I think it goes to, to, to political will and also what um, Deborah spoke about in, in some detail about, about governance. And I just want to read out a statement from, from the, the summary for policymakers of the synthesis report, which is that effective climate action requires political commitment, will align multi-level multi governments and institutional frameworks, laws, policies, and strategies, right? So that's what the assessment says. That's the governance that is needed, right? That is, in a sense, the ideal. Is that the governance that we have in South Africa? Or we can ask it about many other countries in the world, but obviously we haven't the discussion here. Well, not for me as an IPCC author to, to comment on that in, in this section, but, I, but I, I would respond in part also to something that, that, that Happy said in, in relation to calling for policy certainty. I don't think, Happy, that that's that that's possible at this point, right? We can't, we cannot wait uh, for hundred uh, percent policy certainty. I don't think we ever had that, but I think it is um, perhaps uh, quite large at this point. But it is all about decision making under uncertainty, and and I do think that the IPCC reports provide um, really rich uh, information about exactly that. So when uh, talk about ways of managing risks and and working with scenarios, those are some of the tools that we need. And yes, it is complex. It does need, um, you need to read. Um, sorry to comment as a professor, but you do. Uh, some of these things are to every complex, uh, there's, a, there's a saying that goes to every complex challenge is an answer that's clear, simple, and wrong. Um, and so we can't lose. Um, <laughs> I, I will defend the, the, the IPCC uh, outlining the complexity. We, we can go so far and then others need to help with the communication, which is, which is important. The second aspect that I want to comment on um, uh, the, uh, that I think came up in, in, in some of the remarks is that there are also findings relating to climate litigation. So we focused quite a lot on how these reports uh, inform um, uh, the multilateral uh, uh, system, the UNFCCC and its, and its Paris Agreement. And just on the side, I made a comment um, 
in relation to Le uh, Bouchanglaise just transition work program, for example. But if that doesn't work, and, and I'm certainly not working fast enough, I think everybody uh, knows that there is uh, increasing uh, climate uh, litigation. And again, uh, so what the um, uh, what the report actually says is that. Uh, Climate-related litigation is, is growing with a large number of cases in some developed countries and a much smaller number in some uh, developing countries. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, and in some cases, these uh, in fact draw on, on IPCC reports. So um, I think it's also a very important um, emerging uh, development that effectively, um, if, if the countries of the world cannot agree uh, to do certain things, for example, uh, fund loss and damage, um, uh, you know, uh, governments and, and, and perhaps corporations may be sued. There's certainly um, evidence uh, very carefully assessed in the IPCC reports about the growing trend, a growing trend in climate litigation. So thanks, Des. Uh, thank you for that, Harold. And and it's a really important thing that you brought up. In fact, uh, I think a bunch of us are following this request for this advisory opinion from the ICJ. And I, and I think that Melissa, when she's closing up, may have a few words to say about that as well. Uh, let's turn over to Chris. Thanks, Des, and um, I think thanks to the, the other panelists for their comments. I think Deborah and, and Harold have said a lot, so I'll, I'll keep it short. Other than I think similar to Harold to say, from a private sector perspective, I don't think it's it's about waiting for 100% policy certainty. I think the IPCC is very clear that that a role for government is to have integrated policy packages that set a clear direction of travel. But it's also clear that this is an all of society and all of economy approach, where things like innovation and technology efficiency and sharing of intellectual property and support for certain climate actions, it's crucial that that comes from the private sector, as well as things like adequately disclosing climate risk within private sector entities, um, where a lot of that responsibility does rest with the private sector to be part of this transformation and transition across sectors. I think like Harold and Deborah, I'd emphasize the point of equity um, as something that comes through really strongly in this IPCC report in the context of sharing the benefits and the burdens of climate action in the next decades as a way that can broaden trust and support for more rapid climate action within a society. And of course, how that happens in each national context is, is up to those societies and governments. But I think uh, this is speaking in a personal capacity, South Africa is, is taking some of the right steps in things like the PCC, really fostering those discussions on sharing the benefits and the burdens, and that's something we should be doing more, mm -hmm. and that has to be furthered in, in the policy considerations so that there are, is broad support for climate action. And then I think here, going, going beyond um, IPCC, but IPCC is clear here that this, this isn't, as I said, a challenge for any single sort of sector or system. It's a really all of society approach and that all of us individually, but also in our workplaces, as we talk about climate change, as we think about um, climate action, I think often there's this sort of, oh, is it the responsibility of individuals or, oh, it's the responsibility of some like much larger institution like government. I think this IPCC report does a really good job of making clear that it's right across that spectrum. There are actions that can be taken at an individual scale, and these are also needed to be supported by policies, by infrastructure choices at societal and government scale. And so I think I'd really sort of end a comment there that I appreciated all the panelists bringing perspectives from, from their different sectors and um, experiences and, and highlights the diversity of climate action we can take and the diversity of ways to be involved and support these transitions. And I'd hope that South Africa being quite special and unique in the way that it's, it's a country with a lot of challenges. We have a lot of inequality. We also have a high fossil fuel base load. We have things like the Just Energy Transition Partnership. I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to be a test case that really shows the world how it's possible to do this in this decade. Thanks. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, the whole notion about South Africa being a global pilot is a real one. It's been attractive to a whole bunch of international partners as well. And it's something that we should put some pace to. I'm, I'm now going to open up to the other members of the panel as well, because I'm sure there's a lot to react to from what you heard from the from the other um, 
the other participants in this, as well as what has been coming out, both in the Q and A as as well as in the chat. The chat's become a real chat now. There's a discussion going, which is fantastic. I just want to remind you uh, that all of the presentations are already on the website. Uh, Intabi Seng has made sure of that, and it is available to you. And please distribute it as widely as you need to. So, if I can just go back to the panel a little bit. Uh, and maybe start with you again, uh, Happy. W one of the notions in the chat, and this was brought up by Lauren de Kock and, and Stephen Greenberg, questioning whether or not capitalism is the right model to go forward. And uh, Lauren talking about the possibility of a degrowth model. And Professor Rasagan Maraj has been writing a lot about this in recent times. Do you have some commentary on that? I mean, you, you represent that sector that says grow, grow, grow. Is there no? Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, maybe I can respond to that um, at, at at the end, uh, at, in, in the end of maybe my answers to some of the questions that are there. The the let me start here. I think with with what um, Richard Worthington has asked about um, whether or not private sector or even business in general is going to be more proactive and unambiguous in terms of the necessary actions that need to happen. I think there's there's been a lot of work that has been done. We we also been rolling out our own study, which is the just uh, which is the just uh, transition pathways. It was a piece of work that was done by ourselves, Musa and NBI, uh, with the support of BCG, and it talks to what are the necessary steps and the kinds of initiatives and interventions that we need to do in order to reach that net zero and then i'll use the net zero uh, version of prof winkler uh which speaks to not just carbon but just broadly uh in that in that symbolic sense um and and i think we business has started to 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 think about its actual role in in achieving the necessary outcomes that we need to we, that we need to get but we can't run away from the, the the arrangements that we have in the system that we have, right? Um, there's only so much that we can do in as social partners individually when each of us aren't playing the role that we need to play. And of course, there's a large scope of, of, of um, opportunity that private sector can play. There's a large scope for leadership that private sector needs to adopt. Um, but that's in concert with others. That's in concert with other social partners and in particular with, with, with government. So the, the notion of policy certainty is important. We cannot uh, um, dilute it by saying that um, it, it is too complex, that is true. We cannot dilute it by saying that if we don't uh, do something in the midst of that policy uncertainty, we are actually uh, weakening our ability to act. I think what is in, what, what private sector has been trying to say is that provide the parameters where the market can participate, provide the parameters where we can actually under take action and that action will flow. I, th I think if we make an example in South Africa with the energy issue, there was a situation in time where we were about to go gun ho uh, with the REI 4P um, program and somehow government stalled um, with that. And then there were ramifications to that. And that provided a good uh, example of policy uncertainty. So here yeah, I, I agree obviously with, 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 our, with our authors um, or, or from the IPCC. Uh, I was just adding to that that there is a there is a dimension which is nationally specific that we need to take note of. As much as it is true globally, as uh, Commissioner Lewakhan has also indicated, the national circumstance also plays a role, and that's why we have to keep on saying that policy certainty is important. And business has changed its tech. Business has changed its understanding of its role, and it's getting much more progressive and, and, and trying to see as it moves into 2030, into 2050, what does it need to do. I think the issue of, of, of capitalism um, versus degrowth or with degrowth or if there is degrowth, I think, colleagues, we need to uh, be honest about where, where we sit. Um, there's a lot of 
um, unemployment, inequality, uh, and poverty. And one of the ways that we know that we can address that is by providing the necessary opportunities and those services to people. And we need to grow in order to do that. And if there's a way that we can do that in such a way, in such a manner that doesn't require us to grow, then I think we'll be able to test that as a society and then make the necessary decision in order to move in that direction. But in this current state, we, we are finding ourselves where we have to balance and not to trade off, right? We have to balance the developmental agenda as well as the need for, for South Africa to keep moving, to produce what it needs to produce in order to have the necessary goods and services to satisfy the needs of, 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 of the society. And with that, we are very clear, at least as a society, and I think that is common to all, that we need to do that in as a sustainable and low carbon development manner whilst we are undergoing a particular transition, which is just... So if that's where we are, I think we don't have to go back and forth about I, what the ideology is. It's really that we are all in agreement that we have to address climate change, reduce the risk by making sure that we adapt and make sure that when there is loss and damage, we're, we're able to account for it and remedy it as much as we can in the midst of, of the different things that we necessarily need to do, like addressing the, the triple challenge. Thank you. Uh, that was a wonderfully diplomatic answer from business, um, but but lots of food for thought because I mean there's a hard road to travel. Transition is not easy. Uh, Makoma, uh, the, one of the things that Deborah started out with, she said one of the positive things that we can point to is a rising level of ambition in the world, as well as mobilization of various sectors and a rights-based approach becoming a dominant part of the conversation. Is this how you're seeing it and feeling it and experiencing it in the civil society movement? Um, thanks very much, um, Des. Um, I'd like to weigh in a little bit on um, the question that you have asked um, the previous speaker, Happy from President. Um, I would like to say that the just transition is just not about moving from fossil fuels to renewable energy. It is about open democracy and a people-led process that uh, addresses inequalities and injustices facing the frontline communities. So the kind of economic model that is needed is a, a regenerative one, the one that focuses on restorative and distributive justice. Um, on the question that we've asked, um, there's, there's a lot of mobilization that is being done around. But however, um, that should not be the kind of mobilization that is moved uh, away from the justice factors. It should not be a mobilization that brings about uh, false solutions, because those false solutions are the ones that are going to continue, continuously put us in a situation where the climate crisis is perpetuated continuously. So um, I think it is important that we also realize that um, even whatever solutions we bring about, whatever mobilization comes about, it's not only for what we say at an international level, it's for the financing on how we adapt or how we mitigate. It's also about people's dignity and uh, that should be at the forefront. The issues of equity comes first. This is something that we cannot just um, overlook and think that uh, are not at the center. Um, and that's why there's a bigger call on loss and damage for the ecological um, destruction or ecological debt that has been uh, ongoing for, for, for the past centuries. So for restorative justice and also for mobilization, we need to mobilize, mobilize around a right-based approach rather than just mobilizing for governance. But that also is quite important on the governance um, or the governance issues around uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation. So I feel that um, whatever level of mobilization is being done, should be done in a sense of changing or mitigating or improving um, the lives and also not only of people, but also the ecological balance of nature that we so much depend on. Thank you. 
That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, Le Bukhang, let, let's come to you and say, look, the, the challenges are clearly enormous. Uh, the, the, one, the one thing I think we kind of need to be clear about is that even if you took climate change out of the equations, uh, the world as a whole is in a really, really difficult and inequitable space. So maybe the, the point to you is, what are the things you want to see that mobilizes us to not only this uh, lower carbon economy that will ensure the survival of a species and the planet, but also one that seeks to fix up the current ills inside the system towards this global fair deal that you talk about. Yeah, and I think this is why this the need for equity is so important. And you know the fact that we're here in the context of crises after crises, we're still having to motivate the point for equity and fairness is, it blows, it blows my mind. Um, the climate crisis, I think, is making a number of stakeholders to realize that, you know, there is no such a thing as a plan B or planet B. Um, so we should be doing the work and increasing our ability to adapt and increasing our ambition now. But if we continue to follow the current status quo, which is very much fragmented, unequal, only works for a select few, we can't progress um, as quickly as what we would have liked. This is why in my inputs, I do mention the fact that, you know, addressing or, or, or doing the work of implementing a just transition and in fairness and in earnest, doing the work of justice and equity very well we do the work of increasing ambition um, exponentially because you know we don't create a society where again we have we create the the the, the haves little haves and and leave the rest out of the system so unfortunately in the manner in which we 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 have these discussions it seems that we want to cling to a particular status quo that has not worked that continues to leave a lot of people out of the economic system and it, and and the system the system for development, which is why you know the, the 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 conversation is as difficult to progress because it seems as though even in our efforts to create for a to 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 rectify a disaster and an existential disaster that is coming, we seem to still be neglecting the issues of justice and equity. And I think if we address the issues of justice and equity more seriously, we'd have little apprehension towards the targets that we're trying to set. But because the manner in which we address the, 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 the issues of the environmental crisis, we do it in a manner that seeks to do the, the, the work of leaving people behind, this is why we have the type of apprehension that we did do. So I think if, if, if across stakeholders and, and globally, if we were serious about equity and serious about justice, we would increase our ambition quite easily. And it's just unfortunate that we're still having the to, to, to justify why we need equity and justice in today's society. Thank you for that. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, Shlingi, in, in your input uh, earlier, you said that youth being the custodian of tomorrow, as you rightfully are, you should be in charge of monitoring and evaluating our efforts going forward. Uh, how would you like us to make that real? What should be done? What investments should be made to organize for you to be much closer uh, to the piloting seat around where we go to from here? Yeah, I don't see you on my screen anymore. Ah, oh, there you are. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, thank you for, uh, for the uh, question. I think uh, what needs to be done now is currently, um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give an example, a, a direct example, is there's a monitoring and, uh, and evaluation working group uh, uh, within the PCC. Uh, the, uh, um, there should be young people in that um, uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, evaluation. Group and not just one, but a diversity of us, youth from young, uh, from rural areas, and uh, youth from uh, urban areas to ensure um, all youth are, are, are represented. 
but also what else needs to be done is uh, for young people to say, well, um, there, needs, there, there needs to be capacity building for them to understand what exactly are they monitoring and evaluating as well. So they, there's, there's that capacity building that uh, um, that, uh, that is uh, required um, to, to enable the youth to, to, to effectively uh, do that um, monitoring and um, evaluation. So I think for, for me, it's, it's those, those two things, like provide the youth the capacity and, uh, but also the opportunity and include them uh, include them in, in the rooms. Uh, it's slowly happening, but we need uh, more and more of that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So you want opportunity, you want capacity, and you also want indicators that you are seriously being listened to. And, and that has to be fair. And I think that we collectively need to do as much as we can to make that real. Uh, colleagues, it's, it's been a, a great discussion. I know there's a lot more in the chat to unpack. Um, time is never on your side on these issues. So if you'll allow me, I want to give our IPCC panel members uh, just a chance for a closing comment. Uh, and, and then we will move towards the closure of the system. But clearly, this is not the last time we're discussing this. And there are many, many more occasions that would have to be created to take aspects of this conversation much further. So, um, Deborah and the team, maybe we can go to the original sequence and start with Chris for a closing remark. Um, thanks, Des. I hadn't uh, prepared one, but um, just to say thank you very much and for, for this conversation. I've been really encouraged by the diversity of views and rich engagement. And I think that um, in line with my talk, I would really emphasize the urgency here that this is a critical decade of action, uh, a critical decade for climate action, and that the choices and actions we take in this decade will have consequences both for ourselves in intensifying or de-escalating climate risks, as well as our children and future generations. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Uh, Harold, uh, you next, and and can I also push you to to engage some of the issues that we didn't bring into the conversation yet? For example, is our current planning model relevant? Are we still investing in urban sprawl and an outdated mode of transport and an even more outdated mode of other things like sanitation? Yeah, uh, thanks, Des. Um, I'm 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 not an expert on 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 the planning, but as I as I did in the chat, I mean, Deborah is actually the local government official, so I'll, I'll pass that in part to her. But I will point, as I have in the in the Q and A, um, going back to one of the underlying reports in in working group uh, three, had a whole chapter on urban systems and other settlements, and I think looked quite extensively at um, the, the issues of, of urban form. And, and it's a great example of how you know, sectors, are, you know, it relates to transport, it relates to energy, it relates to, to, to everything else. And so, yeah, um, but it's, it's not my own area of expertise. The other final comment I wanted to make, there've been many comments uh, relating to um, equity, justice, inclusion, and, and completely agree it's course, distributional, um, recognitional, uh, procedural, intergenerational, these are all really, really important. I would say that the um, these IPCC reports as a, as a whole really provide a very strong basis for, um, for that inclusion of equity. Um, again, just to, to uh, read out a, a sentence, equity, inclusion, and just transitions are key to progress on adaptation and deeper societal ambitions for accelerated mitigation. Um, but to really take this and translate this both in our national discussion, uh, so uh, I think Klebo Hong, you spoke very powerfully, of course, that's important uh, in terms of all, all the debates we're having around the, uh, the just transition and just energy transition in particular. But I also did want to mention that um, uh, you also did raise that uh, this is also a matter um, globally and internationally and indeed, in the um, in COP27 in Shamal Sheikh last year, there was an agreement on a new uh, joint working program on just transitions and um, the details of that, the modalities, as they are called, are being negotiated this very year. So it's both equity and, and inequalities are both a matter internationally between nations and within countries and most certainly within our own country. And uh, so 
Um, I do think that the, the IPCC reports um, individually and the synthesis report provide a very strong authoritative statement around the importance of equity, uh, justice and inclusion. And it's really up to all of us to take that forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harold. Um, and Deborah, the last one belongs to you. Yeah. And clearly for this one, I'm going to take off my IPCC co-chair hat and put that to the side and, and put on my local government hat. Certainly, I mean, the IPCC reports have indicated that urban areas provide us with a, a, an immediate global scale opportunity to start bending the curve on emissions to improve equity and justice. That's where we've got a lot of people with development needs, our economies are vested in cities, but at the same time, we continue to need cap local government. Uh, you know, the inadequacy of financing, the provision of laws with, in which we can work, much of the work that South African local governments currently do is unfunded mandate because we still sit on our hands in terms of um, the climate bill, which seems to go around and round for, for eternity. And if you look at the international arena, so we've got this enormous opportunity for, for local action, but local government doesn't sit at the negotiating table. We're still regarded as a non-governmental organization. So it's one thing for the science to look at the opportunity and the, the potential for that local action, which can help us deal with some of these challenges, but all of the structures set up totally kneecap local government. So I think that's a real uh, challenge. We, we're going to have to revolutionize the institutional and, and government systems. National government must work in greater partnership with, with local government worldwide. Ultimately, I'm a local government official. So what does the science mean to, to me? You know, very pragmatically, I think, given all of the things that we've seen and heard today, in my mind, it is very unlikely that we are going to, to meet that 1.5 turnoff. And so I think the, the message that I give my staff is we've got to act as ambitiously as if 1.5 is possible. We've got to do everything we can to try and achieve it. But the reality is I think we're going to have to start learning to adapt to three. And I think that's going to be the real policy tension. There's a pragmatic need to acknowledge that is probably going to be a suboptimal future for many around the world. And the question is, what is that toolkit? You know, once we blast past that 1.5 turn off, do we know what we're going to do in the suboptimal world? Because the world is not going to end. The IPCC is very clear about that. The world will continue. But the question is, what do we do under situations where large portions of the world are experiencing these suboptimal conditions? And I don't think we've had the courage to talk about that toolkit yet. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you so much. Thank you so much indeed. Colleagues, thank you all for, for your attendance. And we have tried to incorporate as much as you put into the Q&As, into this discussion. We clearly haven't covered everything. And there is always room to have more and more discussion. I just want to close my bit on two notes before handing over for the official closing to Melissa. Is One, we are incredibly grateful. Uh, to the South African and the African team for their immense contributions to this IPCC process, uh, contributions and leadership. And I think it's something that we should be incredibly proud about. Secondly, there seems to be some movement. You know, when I spoke about this yesterday in a different setting, I was told that people have heard it before, but this week in the Petersburg Dialogues happening in Berlin right now, um, it was pointed out by the future president of the COP, uh, for COP28, that the 100 billion was an issue. The response from the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Germany, Anna Brabach, reported that in the discussions they've had in the OECD caucus, this will be achieved in 2023. Maybe this is one notch on the road towards getting the resources, possibly the governance, certainly the will around moving us forward. For the official closure, I now hand over to another of our commissioners, Melissa Furry. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you, Des. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Um, so, yeah, good morning, everybody. It's almost 12 o'clock. Um, it's, been, it's been a real privilege to observe and listen to the session, the presentations and the, the, the question and answer session. Um, first, on behalf of the Commission, I just want to echo Desigan's comments about our gratitude to the speakers, not, not only for being here today, but for the incredible work that they've done and keep doing um, uh, on this and previous and, uh, and, and future um, IPCC reports. 
Uh, we thank you for your service to the, to the climate, to our country, and for representing our continent um, in the IPCC. Um, I won't make any attempt to try to summarize your presentations. I think you've done an extraordinary job uh, summarizing very complex issues um, and a very comprehensive uh, synthesis report. Um, I think I should just say that I think even for those of us working in this field uh, every day uh, could benefit from more deep dives into different facets of the report. Um, it's very hard not to conclude that every, every slide in your presentation uh, actually requires a separate briefing. Um, uh, and uh, I know that all of you are out there in the public domain uh, doing a lot of this work already, but please do keep speaking and writing and, and help us to strengthen the public conversations uh, around this in South Africa um, uh, with your knowledge and your expertise. Um, I, I must say it was interesting, you know, as I say, for those of us who talk about climate change a lot, I, I'm, I'm quite struck by a sort of sense of, of optimism and opportunity in this dialogue so many climate conversations are not really like that and so um so that's 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 an interesting an interesting um sort of uh, maybe uh, maybe there's a bit of a shift <laughs> going on here for us but uh, um i think the other thing that's that sort of stands out is the extent to which the social partners um represented on the panel were very aligned with their comments and uh, I think there's a general appreciation and acceptance of the science and uh, an agreement that we now need action and we need this urgently. And, you know, I know we say this often, um, but uh, it was it was very notable today that everyone went straight there. I think Thingy we said, talk is cheap, <laughs> quoting one of her constituents. Um, I mean, it was interesting on the urgency issue uh, the, uh, that, that, that this report specifically then talks about urgency so expressly. Um, and and the, the I think it was, I can't remember who was quoting the, 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 um, the bit that said the choices and action, actions implemented in this dec decade will have impacts now and for thousands of years. It's, it's you know, they, they surely, there has been no other time in human history where, where our short-term actions, I mean, seven years is like a blink of an eye. Um, will have such long-term consequences. And, and, you know, one has to ask whether we all really understand the responsibility that we carry in this moment. I mean, do our politicians and do the leaders in our society really grasp this uh, amongst all the social partners? Um, I think we were all struck by Klingewe's report about saying that while others, some people, young people are feeling hopeful, others are feeling hopeless and, and wondering uh, about this, whether living to an old age is is something that young people can reasonably expect. Still, um, all 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 the speakers, and then uh, in the Q and A, and then particularly Happy Kambule spoke about this need for political commitment and and policy certainty. It's certainly something that's been taking up a lot of space in the public narrative over the past months. Um, I don't think it's about complete alignment. Um, uh, we, this is a very contested space, um, but I think what we're currently seeing is pretty extreme in contradiction. Um, I read an article by Professor Swilling this morning, Mark Swilling, um, suggesting that there is a kind of greater policy alignment emerging. Um, I think maybe he was being a little bit optimistic, um, but I think what, what, what Chris referred to as the clear direction of travel is what we're after. Um, and if we if we if we can start uh, identifying that emerging, I think we are um, we are starting to move. Commissioner Mulaisi and a number of other speakers spoke about the issue of justice and equity locally. Um, obviously, something the commission has been thinking about and working on a lot uh, since we started our work in 2020. Um, uh, and this idea of increasing our ambition for justice alongside our climate ambition, um, which is really well articulated, um, Lebuchan. Um, she spoke also about the, this, this paralysis of the extreme inequality and how centering addressing inequality in what we do could potentially block greater climate action. Um, uh, Commissioner Lakala Kala spoke about this, the people-centered and the open democracy approach, you know, and how it is about people's dignity and restoring people, you know, uh, improving people's lives and restoring that balance with nature, um, which again is something that, that is very much reflected in the Just Transition Framework. Um, the global fair deal raised by Commissioner Mulaisi is of course something that is spoken about a lot uh, in the space. 
uh, and and you know that the kind of injustice of climate change in the north south engagement. Um, I, I do worry that there is a risk that that we in the south um, become a bit paralyzed by the resentment uh, towards the north, and that we avoid what we do what we need to do, including taking up some of these critical opportunities for leapfrog, leapfrogging old technologies, exploiting new technologies, and some of these multiple synergies that that um, Professor Winkler was speaking about, uh, because we're pointing fingers at the north, you know. So it's just, you know, not to score an own goal <laughs> by by not freeing ourselves from that um, narrative as well. Um, on the issue of climate litigation, um, yeah, this is of course a whole different topic and something that I, you know, uh, I, I and many of my colleagues um, work on a lot and. Uh, it's it's important to note that there are more than 2,000 climate lawsuits uh, that have been filed in courts globally over the last sort of just over a decade, uh, which is a huge body of work. Um, these cases have been surprisingly successful, um, and they're also getting increasingly creative, um, exploring all different aspects of the law uh, to move both countries and specific emitters into that clear direction of travel that Chris was talking about. Um, and absolutely, those litigation is relying on the IPCC reports. Um, also, because the IPCC represents relatively conservative consensus science, right? So, um, but it is very good to see this being recognized, the role of litigation and unblocking some of that paralysis in our governance and in our financial systems. Um, for Thingy Wei, I just wanted to say something about your comment about the monitoring and evaluation working group, um, which, which I chair. Uh, on the commission, and um, I want you to know that, uh, and everyone else to know that that working group is indeed um, very committed to um, uh, particularly uh, designing a monitoring evaluation system uh, along with um, with the participation of people affected by the transition. And so we are looking at different ways of engaging through representation or otherwise with stakeholders. So just watch the space, bear with us as we as we work through that. Um, yeah, and then I think I want to just close with uh, the reference to the all of society, all of economy approach that I think Chris was referring to. Um, uh, and, and there was a statement made by um, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres um, when this report was released, where he spoke about, uh, he said, in short, our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, all at once. Um, uh, this seems to be a good moment for that quote. Um, thank you all for, every, for your participation, including in the chat and in the Q&A, and thank you to our speakers and the Secretariat for organizing this event. I think uh, let's take the learning from today's session forward into everything we do everywhere, all at once, um, traveling in that clear direction towards climate action and climate justice. Thank you all, and this session is now closed.